So, my first question to you is an obvious one. We are, at the moment, European Union is going through a huge um, challenge, which is Brexit, and that challenge is going to be a challenge for all countries, especially countries like yours and mine, which are having a huge problems inside themselves. So how this will play on entire union and how it will play on a country like us, which they have decision inside of themselves? Right, right. Well, I mean, let me first say that I think what we saw with the Brexit vote, uh, what we're seeing with domestic political developments in Spain, in Italy with the Movimiento Cinque Stelle, in France with the National Front, even in the U.S. with the primaries and the Trump movement, is far more structural and systemic than we seem to think. I think these developments are connected, and they are connected in a way that is producing anti-establishment, anti-elite political movements uh, across the Western world. Now, why that is happening, we're not sure. Uh, there seems to be a growing consensus that it has to do with the erosion of the middle class, and I, 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 I'm in agreement with that. I mean, I, you know, it has to do with job precariousness, with income inequality, with a, a number of issues that have uh, essentially radicalized part of our electorate, people that have felt that they're disconnected from the prosperity that the system has been generating. I have a thesis of my own, which is that technological development and automation and the destruction of jobs and the wealth concentration that it produces is actually one of the driving factors. Now, that is now having a direct impact in our politics, and we're having movements that challenge elite consensus and the liberal cosmopolitan consensus that we have built around globalization, free trade, immigration, cosmopolitanism, all of these things. The EU happens to be one of those institutions of the liberal order. Plus, it happens to be an, an elite-driven institution, which is constructed mostly by political, economic, and intellectual elites. Right? So the Brexit vote, in my mind, is an anti-establishment, anti-elite vote of a large proportion of the British population. If you looked at the uh, reports, the opinions issued before the vote, not a single, I, I mean, I followed the issue quite closely, I did not see a single serious report that said Brexit was a good idea. All of the, most of the large businesses in the country, 200 and something academics signed a letter saying it was a bad idea. Most of the Nobel laureates from the UK say it was terrible for UK research. And despite that, it, uh, they voted to leave by a small margin, but they voted to leave. Right? So there's something about the times that make, makes them extremely unpredictable. That makes me very worried for other EU countries like France and now a number of countries, uh, particularly political, radical political movements within countries have called for referenda on EU membership. The latest Ipsos Mori poll that I saw in Italy said about 60% uh, of the Italian population wanted a referendum on membership and about 48% would vote to leave. I mean, these are incredibly high numbers uh, uh, for referenda and for leaving the EU. So uh, my concern is far more structural and I think we either resolve the underlying structural issue which is hitting the middle class and, in, and eroding the middle class or we're not going to be able to solve many of the other issues that we're worried about and the EU will pay a high price. Uh, European Union is going to go through this challenge for next at least two years till all the negotiations with right. Great Britain are um, done. But Britain will go through uh, one sort of negotiations inside itself with the Scotland which wants to remain in the European Union and yes. wants to get independence. Can that have any impact on the rest of the European um, countries as for example Bosnia and Spain which I have RS and uh, Catalonia which they want to depart. Can that boost up those secessionist movements in the countries? Yes, I mean I think the, the short answer is yes. I think um, you know, the Brexit creates something which, you know, I, I think could be termed a very perverse geopolitics because um, the UK has lived since it joined the EU in a community within the EU where all of the members are interested in collective gains, right? There's hard bargaining within the EU, but on strategic issues, the EU works as a community and it tries to essentially attain what's best for the community as a whole. Now, the minute you're outside of that union, you're into a world of relative gains or realpolitik. And we now have a, a very large incentive, the rest of the EU does, on having the British case be a failure, right? Because you do not want to have a precedent of a country that leaves and does well. Of course, this is politically incorrect. And a lot of people in Europe uh, in Berlin and Paris will say, particularly people in public office will say this is not the case. But the truth is that now the EU has some interest in having this case be a failure. That opens up a number of fronts for the Brits. 
the city, there will be fierce competition over the city. The frontier at Calais in France will probably be revised. The Gibraltar issue in Spain and the Scottish issue. And the Scottish issue will play out in very curious ways because a number of countries will have an interest in having Scotland join the EU. The EU institutions, I think, are going to push strongly for that. Some countries like uh, uh, Bosnia, which is not a member, but Spain is a member, have already said that they oppose uh, the possibility of Scotland joining the EU because we have our own nationalist movements and, again, we do not want to set the president of a region within another country seceding and then joining the EU because that makes Catalan secession uh, far more attractive. I'm of the opinion that the two cases are so radically different, the Scottish and the Catalan, uh, that quite possibly, uh, you know, a, a Spain shouldn't be so adamant in its opposition to the Scottish case. But the more structural issue is the one that I said. I mean, the geopolitics at play are now very perverse, particularly if, they, if the British act on Article 50, they enact Article 50 and they formally begin the process of secession, which, excuse me, the process of leaving the EU, which will take, as you said, a long period of time and will be negotiated. But the moment they activate the treaty, they're out in a real politic world and we're in a relative gain scenario. So they're actively competing with EU members on a number of fronts. So they're going to live in a very different environment to the one they've known for 30 years. So let's move to something what is really um, close to um, us in Bosnia. We have a, uh, such an instable um, government. We have so many parties in coalitions forming a government from far right to far left. Yep. Spain, uh, since last year, doesn't have government almost at all. And you had another election just uh, last week. And there is a still the same situation. And it will probably cause another um, elections. We know that Spain has uh, some 50% of um, youth unemployment. Bosnia has a 60%. Reforms are still not um, started, even in Spain, not in um, Bosnia. Do you see any way how countries, uh, both our countries and a country similar to us, can move forward and make um, situation probably closer to uh, situation before 2008 and that big economic crisis which happened to right. us. So you're absolutely right, there's been a fragmentation in the Spanish political spectrum, but that has also been true uh, in other countries because we have completely new parties emerging. In Spain we have Podemos, which is a far left party, Ciudadanos, which is a liberal democrat party, sort of center, some people say center right, center left, pretty much center party. Uh, and they have it, it obtained a huge proportion of the vote. In, in historical terms, we haven't seen this since the birth of democracy in Spain, right? Where most of the vote had been going to the two largest parties. In the very last elections, which were a few weeks, ago, uh, a week or so ago, actually the Conservative Party did surprisingly well, and they they did much better than the polls were predicting. They have won, and I think they're now in a capacity to form a coalition government of some kind. We're going to need to see, but uh, quite probably we're going to see a Rajoy-led government being formed, a minority government, and then working for a couple of years. The, the, again, the more systemic issue here is that why, why is this fragmentation taking place? Is it just a financial crisis? I doubt it. I mean, I think there's a far... Why, for example, Spain has, according to Oxfam data, about 30% of the population is in risk of social exclusion. There's been some debate about the data and how this is measured, even if it was 20, 25%. This in democracy is an unsustainable level of economic hardship. Uh, and then people are very surprised about the emergence of Podemos, an anti-establishment party. But in my mind, it's a natural, it's almost a natural consequence of hardship, right? And let me give you another piece of data, which to me is fascinating. If we've never been wealthier than we are today in material terms in most of the Western world. If you look at GDP, output of goods and services, we've never been wealthier. The U.S. returned to pre-crisis levels in 2012. The UK was 2014, Spain in about a month or two. So Spain is at historic high levels of GDP and wealth. Now, why do we have an economic crisis, despite the fact that we've never been wealthier, right? We're failing at the governance of prosperity. There's something there about our governance and about how we're not being able to distribute wealth amongst the middle classes that is now so serious that it's affecting our politics and it's radicalizing our politics. So I predict further fragmentation, governance issues, a general questioning of the EU project, of the liberal architecture in terms of free trade and others, unless we resolve the underlying issue, which in my mind has to do with distribution and how you make sure that everybody participates in this huge wealth that the system is actually generating but distributing poorly. So we can say that the left 
is in a big danger and that the rights will have a rise in the next few years if we continue on the same path as we are at the moment. Yes, and more generally, I think the center is in a big danger because the center is where you get moderate votes and the center is where this liberal consensus lies. So as long as this system does not deliver for the majority of people, those people are going to move to the extremes. And you've seen this across Europe. If you ask me, I think there's a risk of the right of the of public opinion moving right, but also particularly moving left. If you look at the situation of social democrats across Europe, in most countries they're in serious crisis. I mean, Podemos in Spain really eroded the, 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 the socialist. You know, uh, in France they're in dire straits. Uh, what is happening is because the middle class is being hit by by this issue of the crisis and the economic distribution of you know of prosperity, uh, that that electorate is being radicalized and moving left. And social democratic parties in Europe seem to have an option, which is they either move left with their electorate, which is to some extent what Corbyn represents in the UK, or they stick to the center liberal consensus, but then they lose their voters, and then extreme left parties pop up. You know? So unless we solve the central issue, a polarization and radicalization of our politics, both left and right.